speech. The basic idea is that um, if you're if you turn on an automatic speech recognition program and you have maybe a document that you want to dictate into, you create this acoustic signal that the computer then um, captures, analyzes, and works to interpret what you said into words that it can provide as text. Um, so most people already have experience using some form of automatic speech recognition as part of their lives. So these are very common for banks um, or credit card companies or like really big companies where they have to handle a lot of call volume. So if you've ever called into a system um, and it's asked, what are you calling about? But you know you're talking to a computer at that point, that is automatic speech recognition. Um, you may have also experienced it uh, using a personal assistant like Siri uh, on the iPhone. Um, there are other personal assistants like uh, Cortana or Alexa as well. Um, as far as language learning goes, ASR is built into qu quite a few different language learning programs, such as Duolingo and Rosetta Stone. Um, but what we're going to mostly focus on today is the dictation programs, and ASR is really the heart of dictation programs, which are um, often provided as accessibility software or are designed to try to make um, producing written text a bit easier. So there are quite a few different examples of programs. There's Windows speech recognition, Google voice typing, Mac dictation, um, as well as Dragon, which was one of the front runners back uh, in the 90s when it first came out, but is still going today fairly strong. And these programs have been increasingly available since their commercial launch, um, kind of in the 1980s and 90s. Today, many of these programs are available across a wide range of devices and are freely available. The programs are flexible, um, which is why we're very interested in these for pronunciation practice or speaking practice in general, um, because they, the program doesn't have a predetermined goal or predetermined lesson that a student has to follow, which means that students can work on uh, what they're interested in working on, or teachers can create guides that go along with uh, what they're teaching in classes. All right, um, Moroz noted that in her study, um, listeners really appreciated getting the chance, uh, or students really appreciated getting the chance to see how listeners might hear them. Um, so usually when we're talking to someone, um, unless there's a miscommunication, we're not exactly sure what they're hearing in our speech. Um, and if there's a miscommunication, it might be hard to identify the source. Um, but Moroz uh, found that students really liked being able to see exactly what the program thought they were saying. Then this tr transcript can be used um, as part of that as automatized implicit feedback. So it doesn't tell students exactly what they're doing right or wrong. That's not the goal of these programs. But um, by seeing what is written down, students can have a, an idea of what they might be doing wrong um, in their pronunciation that may be lead, looting, ah, leading to a loss of intelligibility. Okay. So um, there is a fair amount of recent research that's been coming out that um, indicates that ASR dictation practice may be useful for pronunciation. So in one of my own studies, as well as um, Laura Wallace's work, who's here I see um, in, our, in our audience today, um, there was a recognition that um, students who work with dictation seem to display increased noticing of pronunciation issues. So if a student's having trouble for, uh, with R, for example, and they keep noticing that every time they try a word that includes an R, that it mistranscribes it, um, they might become more aware that there is a continued sustained issue in their pronunciation that could lead to intelligibility loss. It can also lead to increased motivation and autonomy. Um, one of the really nice elements of dictation practice is that uh, students can be handed some of the reins um, for control, uh, and so they can take a more active role in their learning. Um, these programs have also been found to improve segmental accuracy. Um, so if we look at Leah Ken et al, they were looking actually in, at French, uh, looking at the French spell U, um, and they compared a face-to-face -face group um, to an ASR 
practice, dictation practice, they were using a mobile app um, and found that the ASR group improved more than their control face-to-face -face group. Uh, similarly, in my one of my 2019 papers, I looked at a range of segmentals um, and I compared two groups. One was hybrid and it had half of its instruction face-to-face and half with ASR dictation. Uh, the other group did their whole training um, in face-to-face -face instruction. And I wanted to compare their progress and they actually compare, um, improved equally well uh, in terms of statistically significant differences. There no, were no differences between the group. However, um, the ASR program group did show modest, um, modestly higher improvements on a range of segmentals. Um, and despite concerns uh, that have been raised from researchers like Cucciarini and Strick, who have pointed out that we need to be careful about assuming that students can use the transcript as feedback, um, participants do believe that they can use the feedback that they receive in the form of the dictation transcript. And um, in a follow-up study, I was able to show that it helps learners focus on individual words that they're missing or that they have problems with, but also seems to have um, the ability to help them focus on segmental errors as they notice those patterns. So um, one of the big questions that remains is, is it accurate though? Um, because we don't wanna send our students off to work with a program um, that's making a ton of mistakes especially if those aren't related to pronunciation errors in the speech. Ideally, an ASR program would recognize speech as humans do. Uh, so if a human can't understand it, hopefully the computer couldn't understand it. Whereas if a, a human could understand it, the, the computer could as well. <clears throat> so we wanna see that relationship, but uh, it needs additional research. And there are some troubling, there have been some troubling signs um, in some of the recent works that participants still seem to be reporting frustration as they work with ASR dictation program. Um, there hasn't been a ton of work in this. Uh, our study, which we will, will address um, kind of updating this research, but a lot of the earliest work um, happened in 1999 and 2000. And then there hasn't been a lot since then, kind of until the most recent years. So in Conium 1999, um, he looked at 10 English L1 speakers and 10 Chinese L1 speakers, and they both dictated passages and he compared the accuracy. Um, and then in another key study, they compared three groups of speakers, 10 English L1, 10 Spanish L1, um, and 10 Chinese L1. Uh, and now what's really important about this study is that uh, after students dictated 60 sentences, which were audio recorded, those recordings were then played for native English speaking listeners. And the listeners wrote down what they heard and also rated the speech samples for comprehensibility and extentedness so that they could look to see if there were correlations between how humans were reacting to the speech um, for the, the computer's accuracy. Unfortunately, <laughs> back then, <laughs> um, both of the studies found that while there was decent recognition for native speakers, there was insufficient and unreliable recognition of non-native speech. And therefore it couldn't be trusted to be useful for L2 pronunciation practice. This does make quite a bit of sense. Um, originally dictation programs were very sensitive. They had to be trained to a speaker's voice and they weren't designed to handle non-native speech. So we wanted to look and update their research to see how accurate those programs are today. Yeah, so at this point, I'm going to talk about this study specifically, revisiting popular speech recognition software for ESL speech, which is uh, a replication of Derving, Monroe, and Carbonara 2000 that we did to evaluate the current state of ASR programs after about 20 years since those studies. In this study, we were interested in finding out the current accuracy of Google's dictation for native and non-native speech. I think we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, we were interested in Google's dictation uh, specifically, and we wanted to know how accurate it is and how that accuracy relates with human listener recognition or intelligibility 
and how listeners rated comprehensibility and acceptedness of non-native speech and the different segmental errors that occurred in those uh, transcriptions. And um, we'll cover a little bit of definitions for those terms if you're not familiar with that in a little bit. So we collected the data in two stages. In the first stage, um, there were 30 undergraduate and, and graduate students. 10 of them were native speakers of English. And then uh, 10 were native speakers of Spanish and 10 were native speakers of Chinese. Um, they first filled in a questionnaire with demographic information and then dictated 60 sentences in English into Google Doc using the Google voice typing feature. These sentences were the same as those used in Durbing et al. 2000 with their permission. The sentences were five to eight words long and were deliberately constructed true or, true or false statements with high frequency words and kind of um, simple syntax. An example of a true uh, statement that you see on the screen is doctors often work in hospitals and mosquitoes have soft pink fur is an example of a false statement. Speakers' voices were also recorded using Audacity at the same time to be used in the next stage, which I talk about next. In stage two, the recordings uh, were played to 37 English L1 listeners who were all undergraduate students. Um, I should know that 92% of them reported that they had studied another language, so they were a little familiar with um, languages other than English. Two sentences from each speaker uh, was chosen and uh, we played those for each listener for a total of 60 sentences for each listener. Listeners practiced for a minute before starting to rate the 60 sentences. And after each sentence was played, they wrote down what they heard, which is a common, uh, a common measure of intelligibility. Um, and intelligibility is defined as how much a listener actually understands the speaker's intended message. They also rated speech or each sentence for comprehensibility, which is defined as the amount of effort a listener has to put into understanding a uh, speaker and rated the same sentence for accentedness as well, which is defined as how different a pattern of speech sounds compared to the local variety. So basically how much of a foreign accent they perceived. All of these recordings were done on a nine point scale. And um, after that, we also marked phonemic errors on both Google and human listener transcriptions. This table shows the results and percentages for Google voice typing recognition and listener recognition, comprehensibility ratings and accentedness ratings out of nine and segmental errors again in percentages. We see that recognition was the highest for native speech, 96.2. Um, by both Google and human listeners, 96.9 for human listeners. But the overall Google voice typing recognition was above 90% for all groups of speakers, which is really good compared to previous studies. The lowest recognition score was for the Chinese group, both by Google and by human listeners, 90 and 89. Listeners also had the most difficulty understanding speech by the Chinese group and rated them very high in accentedness. Uh, but we see that the rate of segmental errors was the highest with the Spanish group. Okay, and in this table, uh, we compare Google recognition with human listener recognition, and um, it shows that we found correlations between the Google recognition scores for the Chinese group with most of the human measures. It means that human listeners recognize Chinese speech similarly to Google voice typing, if Google voice typing mistranscribed something, human listeners also mistranscribed it. Um, Google recognition also correlated with listener comprehensibility. And um, that means that if Google mistranscribed something, human listeners also found it difficult to understand. They had to put a lot of effort into understanding that statement. And same for listener accentedness uh, ratings for the same group, the Chinese group. The more mistakes Google made in transcribing a sentence, the more accented that sentence was also rated by human listeners. Okay, hey, let's look at two example sentences and compare ASR human recognition by word. In example one on the left side, uh, the doctors often work in hospitals. The words often, work, and in were mistranscribed by Google. Um, and you see that the highest number of human mistranscriptions also happened for these three words, um, 15, 22, and about 13 people mistranscribed those words. And in example two on the right side, um, um, in the winter, the snow is green. Um, the listeners mistranscribed the word green, um, 15 of them, 15 out of 37 of them 
mistranscribed the word green and the, the same word was also mistranscribed by Google. Overall, uh, about 5% of participants mistranscribed words that were correctly transcribed by Google, but about 30% of the listeners mistranscribed words incorrectly transcribed by Google, which shows that participants were also making more errors on words that were incorrectly transcribed by Google. But this figure shows um, in an earlier study, we found that recognition accuracy also depends on the ASR program that we use and the task. Um, as you can see in the gray and yellow uh, bars at the bottom, we found that Windows speech recognition accuracy was much higher for both native and non-native groups when the speakers read sentences to it, whereas it went down with the free speech. Similarly, if we look at the blue and orange uh, bars at the top, we can see that Google, Google voice typing in contrast with Windows did slightly better, better with free speech than with red speech. So there is a difference there too. And here we wanted to show you a few examples so you can get a better idea of what the study really looked like. The first example, mosquitoes have soft pink fur. Um, in the right column, you see human transcription examples and we've pulled uh, four examples out of the 37 human transcriptions for the sentence. The word fur was recognized as four by Google and also mistranscribed by two of the human listeners here. Similarly, in the next example, doctors often work in hospitals, had a few words mistranscribed by Google and by all listeners in these four examples. So again, what Google is doing seems to be related to what some, what some humans are also hearing. And um, Shannon takes over from here to talk about how to get started with ASR. Yeah, so we see a fair amount of potential in using ASR dictation programs for pronunciation learning. Um, and so we wanted to help you all get started with it if it's something that you're interested in. So in this section, we're going to talk about types of ASR technology. So I mentioned that we're going to focus mostly on dictation programs, but we will um, introduce a little bit about some of the other options. Um, we will introduce some activity ideas that you can use with learners. And then Ida will lead us through some tips for introducing dictation work with students and will actually lead us through trying your first dictation with Google. Um, if you have a Google account, you'll be welcome to try along with her. So in this table, you see an overview of some of the, the key technologies that are useful um, for learning that use ASR. Um, the first one I want to talk about is personal assistance. This is um, programs like Siri for the iPhone, Cortana for Android, or Alexa, which is available through Amazon. Now, whether you get written dictation um, with these programs is um, a little bit dependent on which one you use. For example, Siri, you can track um, what the Siri recognized and then what Siri provides as a response, noticing that these are fairly conversational. Um, so the student can initiate an interaction and then get some form of response from the program. Um, and this is actually really good if you want to have students practice like question forms or imperatives because of what you're asking the personal assistant to do. However, these do not provide explicit feedback. Um, so there's not going to be um, any yes, no uh, type of feedback, no accuracy scores, um, and no specific pronunciation um, highlights of like what they might have missed or, or struggled with in that utterance. Okay, so then the next one um, I want to talk about is computer assisted language learning programs. Um, some of the big ones like Duolingo and Rosetta Stone, but there are also other ones like Blue Canoe, uh, which are pronunciation focused and use ASR for accuracy checks. Um, some of these do provide written dictation. Um, the last time I tried Duolingo, it did provide written dictation while the person was speaking. And then once it compared it to its written form, you'd get um, if you did well, you get kind of a ding check, you know, and move on to the next activity. Um, but sometimes they don't as well. Um, so that's just something to keep your eye on. In general, most of these are not super conversational. However, some of these programs will create um, forms of conversations where they provide a prompt and then the student has a range of options where they can respond. If they choose a, an appropriate response and it's interpreted correctly from ASR, then it moves on to the next turn in the conversation. The big pro about using these types of programs is that 
they, the students get explicit feedback. So often they'll get a score or a like, check, you did it right. Um, and they may even get you know, tips for their pronunciation. However, these don't have, um, you can't give students a lot of control within a lot of these programs. They have predetermined lessons, which might be good, especially if a student is overwhelmed by all the things you can do to practice a, a language. Um, but if a student is wanting more control over their learning, um, they don't get as much um, in a lot of these programs. So the ones that we're going to focus on today is um, dictation programs. As I mentioned, these include programs like Windows Speech Recognition, Mac Dictation, and Google Voice Typing. Now, with all of these, you should be able to access the written dictation. Uh, so you can open up a, a Word document, an email, uh, whatever you kind of want to type into, turn on recognition, and you should see the written output. Um, in general, though, these are not conversational. Uh, teachers can create guides that maybe have utterance prompts, um, but you can't have that back and forth for the most part. And students don't receive explicit feedback. Instead, they have to rely on implicit feedback from the transcript that is provided. However, I did note uh, that one of the major advantages of these is that they are flexible. So students can use them for practicing pretty much anything. Um, and teachers then can tailor lessons um, for students to work on. Um, as well as the fact that these are free and uh, or many of them are, not all of them. <laughs> um, and it's easy to submit work. So if students have been dictating into a Word document, it's really easy for the student to save that and submit it to you. Um, whereas some of these other ones, it's a little harder um, to monitor practice. Okay, so we're gonna provide some activity ideas. Um, and we've kind of lined these out in terms of beginners, intermediate and advanced. But you'll see these also tend to move from more controlled activities to um, longer stretches of conversation and freer communication. So kind of that controlled, guided, um, and then free communication uh, that's recommended by Seltzer, Mercia, Brenton, and Goodwood for teaching pronunciation, pronunciation as part of a communicative framework. Okay, so the first activity that you might consider um, as part of vocabulary learning. Now, the teacher could um, prepare sentences with new vocabulary for, for students to practice, but you could also ask students to create a sentence using new vocabulary words that they've learned. Um, if you're using a book that has, you know, a list of vocab from the chapter or something like that, they could have them work on that list. And after they've created the sentence, practice it into the dictation program. Another idea would be to have them work on minimal pair practice. Uh, so have students say two words that are minimal pairs to practice creating those distinct phonemes. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So this is from a Word document. In the first activity, you'll see that on the left-hand side, um, there are words that have include the I or small cap I sound from English, which is a common um, challenge for a lot of learners. In the right hand column, students then enter their dictation. So they would just put their cursor in the blank, turn on the dictation program and say the word. There are a couple of features that I think are helpful that you may want to pay attention to in the way that we've done this. Um, so first of all, up at the top, you'll, say pay, you'll see that it says pay attention um, to the vowel sounds in each of these words. So trying to focus their attention instead of focusing on everything, um, trying to get that vowel sound correct. Uh, also giving students a hint that they can try that a few several, you know, a few times, several times um, to get it correct if they need to. Another feature is the color coding of sounds, which I find is really helpful uh, when you're first introducing sounds to help them keep track of um, which sound they're trying to create. And then um, the final thing is this gray box. So you'll notice that in all of the practice activities that we're sharing, there is a gray box which is where the student actually enters their dictation, um, because that can be probably one of um, the hardest things if you just give them activities to do. Um, they don't necessarily know how to do it or what format that needs to come back to you in. All right, so this is an example then of the sentence reading task because we don't have students to create the sentences. Um, noticing here, I've continued the color coding and you still have the gray boxes for dictation. Okay, for beginners, a couple other activities to consider. 
um, would be close activities. So close activities um, are generally you have a text with pieces that have been removed and that students have to fill in. Um, and you could have a word bank that they need to figure out by, based on the context of the sentence. It could be something that they're listening to and then need to fill in the words. Only difference if we're using dictation is that instead of typing it or handwriting it in, they use dictation to enter that item. And then the final activity idea for beginners um, is a bonus activity. It's not a dictation activity. Instead, it's using call programs. Um, so it's easy, fairly easy to link um, call programs into your teaching because you just get to send students out to practice. Duolingo makes it very easy for teachers then to monitor what students are doing. So Duolingo has really small units, um, short units that students can do in like five to 10 minutes. And they encourage students to do them each day. But a teacher can also assign work and then track on a dashboard what students are completing. Continuing on, thinking about intermediates, um, perhaps those that want to do longer stretches of practice, um, but also thinking about some elements of still providing some support for these learners. So one activity might be mirroring or shadowing. Um, and here we're really thinking about the same mirroring and shadowing activities for the most part that you may have heard of or you may already do in your practice. And when you have students do this, uh, it's helpful to have them listen or watch using headphones. Um, so that then when they talk and use dictation to track uh, what they're saying and their pronunciation, that it's not catching uh, the computer's audio. But they basically just uh, dictate uh, what they hear using either mirroring at the same time or shadowing following a bit behind the speaker. You could also provide students with conversation or utterance prompts. Um, these could be fairly short or you could build in longer ones um, depending on your student's skill level in which there's a, a fairly clear answer that students need to give in response to that prompt. Um, let's take a look at what both of these might look like. So this is how you might set up a shadowing activity. Um, so this is down in the left hand corner, a TED talk. Um, it's embedded in this Word document so the students can play it right there in the document. Um, notice the directions ask students to put in their headphones. Um, play the recording, and then dictate into the gray box. Um, I did also include some words that students might want to pay attention to, sticking with that I uh, versus E theme, um, and they are color-coded. Uh, in terms of short prompts, um, answering questions uh, is a fairly straightforward way to do it. Um, here you'll see a question, um, and I have actually taken these from a source, which will be cited in the handout that we're going to give you, um, that has would you rather questions. And so I just looked for some would you rather questions that have the it or the e sound. Uh, so in the first example, you'll see wins um, and team, for example. All right, and then the student just dictates their response to the question. Okay. A couple of extra ideas for intermediate learners might be picture description. So insert a picture, have students dictate it into um, a box. Or uh, your bonus idea for this uh, for intermediates is to ask personal assistants questions. So um, personal assistants can usually get on the internet and look for the answer to questions. So for example, if you had a speaking lesson about weather, you could have students go home and ask their personal assistant about the weather in a particular location. Maybe you have every student do a different location. You can even have them come back then to class and share what their personal assistant told them about the weather. You can also have personal assistants do kind of fun things like tell a joke. Um, and we're also gonna talk about games for advanced learners. And so you might wanna explore what those personal assistants can do. For advanced learners, um, a really easy activity to build in is simply discussion questions and starting to think about questions that could sustain longer answers. So an example of this is here. Um, what would you do if a million dollars, if you want a million dollars? And then notice that the directions are try to come up with at least three ideas. You may have also noticed that I'm not color coding um, anymore uh, if we're assuming that these are advanced students or that the focus is now shifting more and more to meaningful communication. 
you'll see that the sounds are still probably in there. Um, you might get when, you might get million, um, but not focusing on those as much. Um, and they get this longer response uh, space. A few other ideas that you could use with advanced learners would be have students identify poems or speeches that they like, uh, and then try practicing it to the dictation program. Um, you could also have students prepare and maybe write out or plan uh, a presentation and then practice it before uh, with dictation before they give it to the class. The bonus activity for this level is to play a game with a personal assistant. So I don't know how much people know that this exists, but um, with, for example, Alexa, which is, I've got Alexa all the way through my house, <laughs> we've got all these Echo devices, um, you can add on abilities and then play games with your personal assistant. So for example, you can have Alexa play 20 questions with you, uh, where Alexa tries to guess the thing that you have thought of. Um, you can play Jeopardy with trivia, or another one is Escape the Room, um, which is like escape rooms, which are really popular right now in the US. Um, and you get a time period, and then you get a series of orally presented puzzles that students have to solve in that time limit in order to win. Um, so you might want to explore whether some of these could be fun um, and that you might want to encourage your students to try some of these. All right, so Edie is going to lead us through some tips that we have learned um, from our experiences using dictation. Thanks, Shannon. Do you want to go ahead and um, upload the handout with the example activities right now? Perfect. Yeah, so we wanted to share some tips from our experiences researching and teaching with ASR. Uh, one very important thing to remember is to try the program yourself beforehand and make sure you're comfortable with it before assigning it to your uh, students. You would want to check the accuracy of the program you choose with your speech and keep in mind that it will probably have lower accuracy for your students. Um, you would want to choose a program that is available across multiple platforms and on multiple devices. For example, if you choose Google voice typing, you would want to make sure that all of your students have access to Google, depending on where they are, what country they are. And also that they are able to use it um, both on their phones and on their computers. Or if, for example, most of your students don't have access to computers a lot, but have better access to smartphones, you would wanna make sure to choose an application that works on smartphones. It is also important to focus on activities that can be done practically alone as an independent self-study or as assigned homework, because it might, be a little bit difficult for students to all be speaking at the same time in a classroom, especially if it's a small space. Uh, it will get very noisy, although some of you might have access to sound booths or some sort of barrier that would muffle the sounds from other people um, if you're in a large room. You would also want to create activity guides for your students, providing them with clear directions for how to use the program, how to turn it on, how to where to dictate, as Shannon mentioned a few times, um, or other considerations like, for example, whether they need to manually hit enter to go to the next line or um, other things that you think might be helpful. When designing activities for them to use ASR over a few sessions or a longer period of time or throughout the semester, it's also a good idea to start with more controlled activities like minimal pair picture descriptions to then um, free speech activities like responding to prompts or discussion questions or um, things like that. You can also consider adding hyperlinks to dictionaries or other sources of uh, pronunciation, audio pronunciation of the target words. So your students get to hear and model the pronunciation of that target word and be able to modify theirs um, for ASR to recognize more accurately. And here are some questions for you to consider. Uh, what do they need to do or click on to turn on technology? We have kept saying that, so it um, is probably important. <laughs> Clear instructions are important for students to get it right. And um, how many times do you expect them to try an item before moving on if the program cannot identify the lexical item? Because I think automatically students would go in and want to fix the mistranscribed word and you want, we would wanna make sure that they're not doing that depending on what the purpose of your activity is. Uh, students may maximize benefits by trying three times and then moving on. But then it's also important to um, think about how 
you want to grade the paper or grade this activity? Um, what do they need to submit at the end of the practice? Are you looking at their dictation or are you um, monitoring their um, activity in a different way? You can use a shared Google document that students can add to as they practice and you can be monitoring that. Um, but you can also be asking, you can also ask them to do a recording of their practice or um, just check their final dictation that is done. Um, or will you be grading those um, dictations or completion of the activity only or the correct dictations? So these are questions to keep in mind. And here is a screenshot of Google voice typing in Google Docs, but I'm gonna show you actually on my Google Drive um, how it works. Let me share my screen. Here's my Google Drive, it's a new folder. And I'm gonna go on the top left corner on new and create a new Google Doc. It opens a new Google Doc for me and I need to have the menu bar open, which I have minimized before. But under tools in the menu bar, if you click on voice typing, this little window pops up and you can click on the mic icon to start recording uh, or transcribing. And you can choose the language here as well. There are a lot of languages that Google supports at this point, and there are a lot of varieties of English, Australian English, Indian English, that it is uh, trained for. So it would work better if you choose, for example, if you're working in India, it's better if you choose Indian English um, for your students to practice with. So I'm gonna click on the mic icon and just try a little bit. Okay, I'm very excited to show you how Google voice typing works. It is working great. Awesome. And thanks so much for listening to us. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you so much. This was a very interesting talk. And um, if that's all, I will move on to the questions. All right, thank you so much, Shannon and Ide. This was very interesting and lots of people liked it very much. I can see that they are looking forward to using this in their classrooms. And I have a couple of questions for you guys and I'm gonna get started with them. Okay, so the first question comes from Valeria. Um, she has a question on the minimal pair activity slide. And she says, how do you create the document? Is it a Word document, PowerPoint slide with the gray boxes? What I mean is, how do you add the Google dictation feature to your materials? Um, yeah, I would be, uh, I think I can take this one. Um, so you have different options um, for how you uh, put those boxes in there. Um, for the, the document that I just shared as a resource, um, that was actually created as a Word document. Um, and all I really did was um, for the boxes that were standing alone, those were text boxes that were just colored. Um, and the, the ones that looked like tables were actually just tables. <laughs> um, so it's really quite easy to do that part. Um, and if you build those tables straight into Google Vo uh, Google's Drive um, documents, um, then students can follow the steps that eBay did and dictate straight into the document. Um, with Windows speech recognition, it's a part of the Windows operating system. Um, so if you got it started and you had Word open, um, all you would have to do is um, hit the icon that would be up at the top of your screen once you got that going um, and straight into the document. So the document itself is not hard to create at all. It's basically just teaching students how to turn on that feature. All right, thank you. So here's another question. Actually, there are lots of questions for you. Um, one of them is, have you found any significant differences with the reliability of Google voice typing in a speech recognition for speakers with L1s other than Chinese and Spanish? Do you wanna take this on E-Day? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have been looking at other language backgrounds 
Um, so if you notice in the table, um, Chinese was, there was a statistically significant correlation, but for Spanish, there was not. Um, we've recently added in Arabic um, and I don't think we found, it. we've done some of the analysis, we haven't completely finished. I don't remember seeing significant differences um, in that study um, between Arabic and the other language groups, um, but it's something that we're gonna have to explore a bit more. Okay, um, nice. Okay, so there's another question. I was wondering if using ASR would be more for practice and feedback rather than a higher stakes assessment. I mean, Ida, do you want to say something? I didn't hear the question right. Can you repeat us now? The question is, I was wondering if using ASR would be more for practice and feedback rather than a higher stakes assessment. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I think we have been exploring it more for, for feedback at a classroom level and for teaching and practice. I don't think at this point, this is my personal opinion based on our experiences, but I don't think at this point um, the assessment would be very fair um, using ASR because of the problems that we saw with um, different languages and, and the differences between human listeners and uh, machines. So I would not, myself, I would not use it for higher stake assessments at this point. Hopefully in some years, a matter of years. Yeah, you never know when the accuracy goes higher, right? Um, the other question is, is there a good alternative for our students who are taking classes remotely and cannot access Google in their home country? Um, yes. <laughs> Ida, do you want to take that one? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, we focused on Google because that's what we have been recently using, but a lot of devices have ASR on them, and I think that might... Um, answer another one of the questions that I saw coming in about what if we don't have internet and Google voice typing needs internet, of course, because it's Google and um, but computers, Mac computers and Windows computers, they both have built in ASR programs, which you can simply find. Um, it depends on the device, but it, it's very easy to find if you just search how do I use um, voice typing in my Mac OS, whatever the version is, or your Windows, whatever the version is. Um, and, it, and it's pretty easy because you can use it in different types of documents. For example, you have a Word document um, and you want to type in it in the Word document without any internet connection, you can start your computer's voice recognition system and do that. And they usually have um, shortcut keys, which I like very much and I use for my own purposes without like having to practice for pronunciation, <laughs> but it's, they're pretty handy too. Maybe they're not as, as good as Google is um, in some levels, but we haven't looked at that yet. Okay, thank you so much for the entry today. There's uh, another question which is actually asked by more than one person. And it says, is there a way to tell if the students dictated rather than just typed in, in the word sentence, et cetera? Ah, <laughs> this is one of the trickier aspects. And actually um, my first study with automatic speech recognition, I intended to analyze the practice documents that they submitted. <laughs> and then they admitted that if they couldn't get it by their voice, um, they were just typing in the answers. Um, so there's not a perfect solution uh, to this yet. Um, I think that one of the most important things um, would be making sure that students know that missing items is not a part of their grading. So we mentioned, think about how you're grading. I would heavily encourage you to focus on dictation activities as a submission, right? They get points for submitting it and doing it because if you start grading for accuracy, that's when you're gonna get much more of the cheating and they're not gonna get what, you know, the learning out of it that's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Um, another comment question is uh, from Jonas, and he says, I've not tried ASR with students much, but I was wondering, is it possible that sometimes the ASR system tries to make sense of what students say from the semantic syntax of the sentence rather than entirely on their speech? I mean, if it misinterprets a word that it compensates recognition 
according to the syntax semantics of the sentence. Yes. Um, Ida, do you want to talk to that about that one? Sure. Um, yeah, that is possible. And that's why for lower level level learners, we would want to use more like controlled activities like words and minimal pairs and like very short phrases. Because um, as you saw when I was um, dictating into this Google document that I had open, um, it actually doesn't type in the whole sentence on, until you're done or until there is a longer pause. So yes, it does rely on the um, context of each sentence to type in um, the full sentence. And it might be that, but that's a good sign because it is based on what is, what is hearing as a whole, which a human listener would do, um, they guess what the word was. And that's basically the purpose of intelligibility. As long as you understand the whole idea, um, it, it doesn't matter if, if, you, if, if a listener doesn't understand a single word, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question uh, in terms of class and use, I guess. And this question says, do you assign these activities to be done in class or at home? Most of my students do not do homework. I mostly work with adult students who take private classes. What would you suggest? So in general, I've mostly assigned it as out of class work. Um, I have had some students who didn't have access to computers um, at home. And so they tried to use computer labs, um, but that can get very tricky um, because they're often surrounded by people um, who are not making noise and suddenly those are the ones making noise. Um, but in terms of those students who, who don't do a lot of work at home, um, one of the things that you might find, I don't know, um, because students become so much, uh, can become very motivated uh, in self-directing their learning, is that if they think it's a cool way of practicing, if they get kind of excited about it, um, both my study as well as Moreau's, um, students started showing more interest in using that um, as part of their daily life, as part of like their own practice with their own goals um, than necessarily a teacher-directed goal. Um, I don't know if you have other ideas to add to that, Ide. Um, I think I just heard that it, they have, this person who asked the question has private classes with adult learners. So it could definitely be used in class because the only problem we um, were thinking of was the noise that will be created with like 20 students using it in, in the class. But if you have private or small um, classes, I don't see any problem with using it in class. Sure. Okay. Yeah. There's also another interesting comment and uh, which might have some questions in it. It says, I think these are very insightful ideas for learning teaching practices. It does not only work for students, but also support teachers to determine the weaknesses and work on those specific areas, which I believe will efficiently result in sessions, both as recycling and feed -in. Thanks for sharing this. I want to share this with you. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here that I'm missing. I think I'm not seeing any other questions, but if there, if there are more questions, please make sure that you put them in. Uh, I see a bunch of people are thanking you for the great idea. And a couple of people mentioned other programs like Kaltura. And um, it's very uh, nice to see other uh, programs written in the chat box. Well, thank you so much, Shannon and Ide. This was a great session. And I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, on behalf of TESOL International Association, and hopefully we'll be able to listen to your talks uh, in virtual conferences or the in-person conferences soon at TESOL again. And uh, thank you everyone for joining the session, this webinar today. Uh, it was wonderful to have you all. And remember that you can find the recording of the session in about two, three days after the webinar is over. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Shannon and Ide. Have a nice day and uh, you may leave the session now. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. I see that somebody is asking for the handout. Um, they can't find it. Do you, do you wanna? I can share them. Yeah, we still have time. So uh, if you wanna share things on in the chat box. Okay, see. I put, oh, I put it, let me put it back to everybody. Okay, all right. That link um, should take you to the document. It was originally created in Word, so I'm not sure how everything carried over, but it looks like I can't 
share the document directly. Well, I'd have to upload it um, in other ways. Um, I could also pro provide that to CNM um, in case, or, okay. or you can email right. me as well, and we'd be happy to provide it. All right. Well, thank you so much. From Drive mm -hmm. as a Word document. Mm -hmm. Should be fine. Okay. Yeah, I see the I see the link there. Yeah, that should work. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chan and Amy This was wonderful. Thank see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.